Welcome to the podcast again. Uh, uh, it's about video number three. And this time I got the light behind me. I think it uh, works a bit better. I guess we'll find out. Uh, I'm at my house. And uh, I've just been sick for two weeks with COVID. Oh man, kick me in the ass. Uh, what I was going to talk to today about, I was going to talk to you about uh, a fight I had in Bosnia Herzegovina. It's a kickboxing fight. And uh, I got the offer. I can't remember who my manager was at the time. And they said, hey, you want to go to uh, Bosnia to have this kickboxing fight? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be really cool. Uh, and it was just after they had all their problems. So me and Alex, too, and my coach, uh, you know, we get all the passports and stuff done. And getting to Bosnia Herzegovina by itself was just a crazy thing. When we get there, the plane lands, and as soon as they hit the tarmac, you know, like 90% of the people just stood up. They'd given up completely on, you know, caring about all the small rules that the regular world seems to worry about. It was funny as hell. And there's obviously someone smoking in the toilets as well. You could smell it all through the plane, and the the, air, the airline staff didn't care. Uh, or if they did, I think they'd just given up. And so we went out to the tarmac because a, a tarmac it, it, it parked right there and so we walk out and it, it was it was so cold it was a clear day but it was freezing cold so we get out and we start uh walking over and there's military everywhere i don't know if it's the, at that time i didn't know if it was the military for the government military or the united nations or whatever but this time uh looking back actually i think it was the government military and they started sectioning people off and I'm like what the hell is going on and they're kind of yelling in Bosnian uh, which I guess is Croatian or maybe Bosnians have their own dialect I know it all used to be Yugoslavia uh, so it could not it could have even been Russian uh, and if you're Bosnian and I mess it up I'm sorry <laughs> uh, I don't want to be that guy and, but they were, they were putting these people off and they were kind of shoving them with their AKs. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Scared the hell out of me. I'm talking to Alex. I said, what's going on? He's like, man, I don't know. So, so we get into the uh, the airport. There's a big long line and all these kind of badass, you know, scary looking security. And we get to my turn. We hand over the, the passport. And I said, oh, here, here's a passport. And the guy looks at me. And my passport. And he says, uh, who's telephoning with you? I said, oh, that guy there behind me. And I looked at Alex, and Alex is a, a small little kind of Polynesian looking guy. And you can see the confusion on the guy's face. He's like, are you guys lost? This is clearly not a holiday destination. And Graham and Tuitavate are not exactly, you know, you know, Bosnian last names. And he says, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm here to, uh, I was just about to say I'm here to fight. But then clearly I realized that if I say something like that, they're going to look at me and go, no, get out or go to jail or something. So I said, oh, I'm, I'm here for the kickboxing. And the guy looked at me. <laughs> like, hey. And he says, one minute. He walks off and talks to the other guys. And the other guys are all standing there and looking back at me, go and talking. Of course, I, I have no idea. I can't speak any other language. So I've got no idea what's happening. And, they, you know, they, they're talking. Uh, and it's not like, hey, this is great. We've got someone and we don't know. It's like, to me, it's not like, oh, yes, yes, we're going to chuck this guy in, in jail. We don't care. Yeah. Anyway, so he comes back and said, you're here for a kickboxing, huh? I said, yeah, yeah, there's a big kickboxing thing on. I'm like, I'm trying to be as friendly as I can. And hey, uh, and he goes, yes, 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 you kickboxer. I said, yeah, yeah, Peter Graham. Right? So there's a big event on. I said, yes, yes, I know. And he's a coach. I said, yeah, yeah, he's my coach. I'm like, oh, finally, they they, they, they realize who I am and uh, what's going on is, okay, stamp, stamp, come through. Like a uh, like a nightclub door, and oh thank God! And then I said, turned to Alex. I said, Alex, I have no idea 
who's picking us up. I mean, they, they told us someone's going to pick us up, but I had no idea, um, apart from his name, who it was. And uh, we, we've gone through customs. You just pick up your bag and then you, you're through. There's no checking. It's like if you're here and you're bringing things in, they've got bigger things to worry about than, you know, smuggling in fruit and nuts. Uh, and I guess all the other contraband like drugs and stuff that you know, they just drive them in, right? Anyway, so we get there and I said to Alex, I said, who, who, who are you? who's going to pick us up, man? And he said, I don't know. So we walked through and this massively tall Russian guy, the most cliche Russian looking mobster gangster, you know, black leather jacket, you know, no smile on his face, white as a ghost, because Peter, Alex? Okay. Yeah, a uh, lot of smiling and trying to be friendly. And he goes, um, come with me. And they didn't give us any idea, didn't say, hey, welcome, I'm here from the, you know, from the, the, the promotional company to pick you up. He just goes, Peter, Alex, come with me. So we're walking, we walk outside now in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and there's all these kids around, they're selling fake cigarettes. They're, from what I understand, they're real cigarettes, but they're packaged like in a Marlboro package, you know, in the carton, uh, and it's just using crappy tobacco. And everyone's like, "You want cigarettes? Cigarettes?" I'm like, "No." Oh. Anyway, so we go in the car park, and there's just all like 1990s uh, stolen BMWs and you know, and Mercedes Benz. And after I was to find out that 90% of the cars in the country were stolen from Europe and brought back uh, to Bosnia. And I was like, and they all had, you know, the little uh, stickers on the back with their D for Deutschland and stuff like that. And when you start to look around, you go, that's crazy. Yeah, this just, they just buy them and drive them down and sell them or keep them or whatever. So we're walking through the uh, car park and then there's this one massive American SUV that just, you know, brand new, top of the range, decked out. There's bloody TVs all in it when everyone wanted to have heaps of TVs. And we jump in. Uh... And uh, it's left-hand drive, but the, the the ticket guy taking the ticket for the for for the parking was on the on the other side, it was on the right hand side. And we're driving and the guy says, Can you put the window down? And I go, oh yeah, sure. I put the window down. And the guy in the little booth, because it's freezing cold as well, right? He was like, he must have said something like, Can I have your ticket, please? And this guy's just turned around and said, What do I know? The boom gate goes boop and we drive through and we're just driving right just bombed out buildings burned out cars fields and this guy's not saying a single word probably because he didn't speak any english uh but it didn't make me feel any better it certainly didn't make alex feel any better we're just sitting there going oh well i guess we'll find out whether we're being kidnapped or we're going to the hotel for the fight uh, real soon so we we just we drive for like seems like you know hours it wasn't it was like 40 minutes or something and we turn up to this hotel and in the front of the hotel like where the steps are going in where you drop off the passengers and stuff uh, there's like a burnt out motorcycle like a Harley Davidson kind of cycle it's just sitting there everything else is immaculate except for this one burnt out Harley Davidson and that's uh, stayed there for the entire time we were there. It was like, what the hell is this? It, and it was like, like must have been some kind of sign, like this is what happens to people who mess with us. And I was like, man, it was kind of eerie. So we went inside and it's basically like a, uh, it was like a Russian gangster hangout. You know, it was no one else there except people who worked for the company. Um, I, maybe no one else could afford to go in the hotel. It wasn't an unbelievably nice hotel, but it was immaculate. Like everything else around it was damaged or really poorly done. Like it was a poor country, it was sad. But this one place was obviously looked after. And so we go inside and they check us in and everything like that. It was, it was, uh, it was like fine, we're going to walk around. And every time we were walking around, every time we heard uh, like a big vehicle coming over the, over, the, over, the, over the street or over the, not mountain, what do you call it, over the hill. And we couldn't see them. Alex thought it was a tank. And he's like, oh, man. See, it's not a tank, man. We're not going to get blown up or anything. Uh, but looking back, we probably could have been a lot more careful. But then we're going into a little town. And we're looking around. 
and we're walking up basically the main street and you see the United Nation walking in, you know, like uh, two on one side, two on the other side and they got their guns out and the guys were young as like 18, 19. Uh, and I'm like, man, that is some scary shit. We think got such young guys with, you know, obviously doing some kind of military service or something. And I thought that's, it just, you know, I've never been in a war zone. Thank God I never had to. And anyone who has, and anyone who's in the military, I mean, that, that's, you know, some crazy stuff, man. Uh, shout out to them. So brave. You know, I, got, I had some friends who are in the military and stuff. And, you know, some of the stories they tell you, it takes, you know, takes it to the next level, especially compared to, to fighting. Anyway, so we're there for a day or two. Uh, we get to meet everyone. everyone's super friendly and super nice and you know it's it was you know it's amazing how people who just come through a war were not angry at all in the slightest they were just super friendly super nice like every single person was just hey that's great tell me about Australia and oh you know we were it's so nice of you to come because people don't come everyone's scared and everything and uh, I'm like oh yeah cool man so we get to the fight and what they done is there was like a uh, a bombed out, burned burnt out uh, uh, indoor soccer stadium, like but a, a relatively small one. Uh, and what they've done is they fixed it up and rigged it up so they could have this kickboxing uh, fight night there. Uh, so we we get there and it's like I said, it's cold. Not not Australia cold, not South Pacific cold, but Europe cold. Uh, and if you're not from Europe or a cold country, it's way colder than you can imagine. Uh, and I'm there and I've got this massive jacket on. I've got my face covered. And the big Russian guy, he's working on the door. He's making sure no one's trying to get through without paying. And I figured he'd recognize me, at least my eyes, right? So I go, hey. And he's come up to me, grab, grab the thing across my face, going, <laughs> and I'm, he's, oh, Peter, oh, sorry, come in. I'm like, oh my God. Like, and th these guys don't muck around. They're either 100% on, super friendly, or I'm going to kick your ass. And that means taking a long walk into a forest and only they walk back. Uh, and I guess that's the way you've got to be in those kind of places and circumstances, right? So I, I, I was like, okay, cool, that's cool. Uh, and I get inside and inside the venue, there's no heating at all. I check the ring and you know meet some of the other fighters and everything's fine you know pretty much like a normal show pretty well run uh except there's military inside there's you know camouflaged you know automatic weapon holding military guys for security I'm like I'm just gonna try to forget that they're here for a reason and uh go and do what I gotta do it was so cold inside that there was a tiny little room that we were in and we'd close the door, and there must have been about, to begin with, there must have been about 10 guys in there. I'm talking three meters by three meters room. Uh, and we had a heater on, I had all my clothes on and my jacket on, and I'm trying to warm up in this room. I was the main event. Uh, and, you know, one guy was going out, and another guy, and uh, then <clears throat> it was just me. And I said to Alex, I said, hey, man, do you think they let me fight with a T-shirt on? <laughs> he just got, no, Pete, you, you can't fight with a T-shirt on. I'm like, okay. So we get out there, my, my my toes are numb, um, you know, I'm shivering, it's so cold. This is warming up in a room with a heater and a jacket and everything by the time we got, and it was, you know, just get out. And it was so cold in the stadium that in the corners there was ice, uh, you know, from when people taking a drink through in the round. Uh, and it'd be, you know, frozen in with, you know, a bit of faso and a bit of blood and everything. It was, it was just out of control. And, uh, uh, I was like, okay, just focus on the fight. So I was super pumped up for this fight. Uh, we went out there, we touched gloves, and then I remember the first kick, I was sitting back, whoosh, it's hard as going to show, make this guy know that, you know, we're, we're not going to muck around. We're here for the, you know, we're here for the bizarre. And my feet stung so much. It never hit someone, and I hurt so much, not, not them. I had the fight. I lost on points. Some might say, it was one of those fights that was kind of important to lose. Uh, not that not that I intentionally tried at all. 
Uh, I was a bit pissed off to begin with. I thought, this is bullshit, man. I, I won the fight. I was a bit grumpy. But really, you know, I lost the fight, but the whole stadium had won. And I guess out of every fight that I ever had that I lost, I think I, I'm, in a way I was kind of happy to, you know, to lose. Take one for the team, so to speak. Because these people have lost everything. I just lost the fight. Turns out it, it wasn't a bad, bad, bad thing that I lost. I went to um, the after party and they're all there. It's a funny as hell. All these guys are drinking everything. It's a bit of have a drink, have a drink. Come on, we know we're there. You did a good job. Sorry about the, the outcome of the fight, but uh, we're really happy you're here and have some more drink and have some more fun. And then uh, they say, uh, Peter, you want to come to the nightclub? I said, yeah, sure, let's go to the nightclub. Uh, and we get out there, and this guy's got the top of the range, Mickey Mouse Audi, and his, I'm like, I, I like cars, I love cars. And I'm not a massive Audi fan, but top of the range, you know, super fast, super big sedan, I'm into that. And he goes, uh, and I'm telling him, I said, man, this is sick, this is a new one, right? You know, we don't even have that one in Australia, you know, it's just a European model. Yes, yes, yes. He goes, you want to drive? I said, oh, I probably shouldn't. You know, it's, you know, you, know, you guys drive on the other side of the road. It's dark. It's icy. Uh, I don't know the roads and I've been drinking. He's like, no, no, he's okay. Here, it doesn't matter. And I say, oh, cool. So we get in the car and I'm screaming around these dark, icy roads. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't drink drive. Uh, I was a lot younger. Uh, uh, and don't do it. It's a, it's a really dumb thing to do. Probably up there with one of the most stupid things I've ever done in my life. And we get there. And Alex said to me, he goes, Pete, you were, he goes, I thought we were going to die. I said, yeah, but it's a good car. We would have been okay. He's got full of airbags and, you know, so, yeah, they're going to drive back. I said, yeah, no worries. So we get to this nightclub and the guy standing on the door, besides being monsters, they're, they're holding, you know, automatic weapons. And I'm like, uh, how come, the, you know, how come they got weapons? And one of the guys with us was like, in that gray area, he wasn't kind of, he wasn't kind of, uh, you know, like Russian mob, and he wasn't with the United Nations or police. He was kind of like the, you know, the go between the two. And his job was to, from what I understood, was to make sure everything kind of worked smoothly there, which it did. And I, uh, he goes, well, Peter, you know, I still, still here have a lot of problems. Uh, these guys I need a gun. I said, uh, he says, uh, everybody, everybody pretty much have a gun. I went, oh, right. So we, we'd gone in. This time he says, uh, I said, I, I don't have a gun, mate. Everyone else has got a gun. And I said, has, has everyone gone? He goes, yes, 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 I have a gun. He has a gun. One of the other guys with us. And there was another couple who said, yes, I have a gun. And I said, she's got a gun as well. She goes, yes, yes, it's dangerous. I said, shouldn't I have something? He goes, no, 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 Peter, you don't need gun. You're a fighter. <laughs> he was he was 100% sure that it didn't matter that uh, I, I didn't have a gun and everyone else had one. He was like, you know, like the Matrix or something. I don't know what he thought I could do, but I definitely couldn't. Anyway, so it, it was, uh, it was a, a crazy feeling to think that these guys think that because uh, I was a kickboxer, I'd be able to look after myself when everyone else had a gun. Uh, and the rest of the night went fine. We, we went out and danced and you know, met some great people. And we went home uh, back to Australia. I'm telling all these stories to people and they're like, are, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, man, this is, this is a crazy place. But I guess the, the biggest thing I learned I remember when I came back to Australia and you touched down, it was summer in Australia, it was warm. Uh, you know, it feels safe. It feels easy. And you just know that, you know, there's not going to be a war. This is Australia, you know, it's miles away from everything. <laughs> there's never been one. I mean, in Darwin, World War II, we got bombed once. Uh and it just makes me so grateful that, you know, I get to live in such a cool, safe country. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful 
that, you know, what, what I got from kickboxing is got to see the world and go, hey man, that's really cool and I really like those places. But it also gives me that understanding when I meet people from other countries and the reason they behave the way they do and you have a, a better insight. And uh, I highly uh, suggest now that we can travel again, anyone who hasn't done much traveling, go somewhere, anywhere, even if it's just to New Zealand or, you know, some Polynesian countries, which are awesome. But go somewhere a little bit off the beaten track and I'll give you that understanding. It's like, you know, we're, we're the same. So when you see some of this crazy shit going on, you go, man, uh, I get it. And I get why they're being so angry, you know, because it's, it's terrifying. Uh, and, you know, anyone who thinks that, you know, fighting in a ring is tough, you know, it's not. I mean, no one's shooting at me. It's only me and another guy in the same weight, about the same, you know, level of ability. If it gets out of control, someone can jump in and go, okay, you can go home. Uh, and it's nice to know. All right, well, that's my story. I hope you liked it. We'll talk soon when I do another podcast. See you later.